doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. Good day and uh, welcome to the CFA Asset Owner Council's World Bank uh, IMF Annual Meetings Week virtual launch of the CFA's uh, SDGs and ESG Infrastructure Investment Impact Framework. Uh, this marks the occasion of the launch of our global asset owner industry SDG Investment Framework that uniquely measures the impact of the SDGs and SESG on infrastructure and real asset investments uh, and portfolios. Uh, my name is Hubert Danso, and I am the CEO and Chairman of Africa Investor and the Chair of the CFA New York's Asset Owners Advisory Council, and will facilitate the official launch of the CFA SDGs and ESG Infrastructure Impact Framework launch. Uh, by way of background, uh, during the annual 2019 CFA Climate and ESG uh, Asset Owners Summit, hosted in partnership with the Principles for Responsible Investment, a resounding theme was the dearth of information available to assist asset owners measure the impact of their real asset portfolios on both ESG and the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. To address this challenge, the um, Asset Owners Advisory Council approached GRESP the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, CISL, and Africa Investor, AI, as technical partners to work with a high-level brain trust of asset owners to investigate the creation of a framework for asset owners to measure the impact of infrastructure assets on the delivery of the SDGs and ESG. I chaired the Global Summit's infrastructure panel with speakers from the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund, APG, JP Morgan, and GRESP. And at that point, I undertook to chair this initiative with the phase one goal being to launch the foundational framework platform developed by and for asset owners to measure the impact of infrastructure assets on the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals and ESG, um, and in time for the 2020 World Bank uh, IMF uh, annual meetings. Challenged as we have been by COVID-19 to deliver this task, this would not have been possible without the dynamic support, uh, insights and leadership from the Brain Trust members and technical team. And I would like therefore to thank them again, particularly the Brain Trust members and the technical team for their unwavering support in terms of getting us to this position to meet the goal and the timeline for today's launch event. I would also like to add a special mention to the GRESP team and CFA New York for always so gracefully going uh, above and beyond our expectations to deliver a unique um, framework initiative. By way of recognition, um, the Brain Trust collaborators include the CFA Asset Owned Council, UNPRI, the Invest Association, the Global Listed uh, Infrastructure Organization, the Long Term Infrastructure Investors Association, the World Pensions Council, the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund, Pensions for Purpose out of the UK, the Council of Institutional Investors, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism, GRES, SASB, the Continental Business Network, the African Sovereign Wealth and Pension Fund Leaders Forum, GIN, and Africa Investor. This launch is uh, designed to provide you with an introduction to and insights on the framework and its uh, user guide, which was developed with numerous rounds of industry uh, input, refinement, consultation, and support over the last uh, 12 months ahead of this formal launch on schedule during this week's World Bank uh, IMF annual meetings. The program for today's launch will feature a keynote interview with Jing Dong Hua, the Vice President um, and Treasurer of the World Bank Group, um, to remind us about the important impact uh, we as asset owners are and can have on the sustainable finance and infrastructure build back better investment agenda. 
Uh, that will be followed by the unveiling and presentation um, of the uh, framework um, and the methodology, um, which will then be followed by a panel of our Brain Trust leaders um, and conclude with closing uh, remarks. So to get us going, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to invite one of the luminaries and great visionaries. I think many of us take for granted the green climate and sustainable finance agenda. Um, but let me remind you that you know, these things come through leadership and innovation and just sheer determined approaches to wanting to change the world for a better place. And I, I can personally say, having known him for a good number of years, that is all embodied in the role that Jing Donghua has played, um, you know, in really driving this climate finance and sustainable finance agenda. Um, so it's my pleasure to invite Jing Dong to join me for the launch uh, keynote uh, interview on global sustainable finance, infrastructure investing, and the role that asset owners can play uh, in the leadership thereof. So, Jing Dong, a, a real pleasure, as always, to, to have you here with us, and thanks for your continued uh, support uh, and leadership with our initiatives and, and making the time during probably the busiest period in your calendar. Um, it only goes to show your deep support and commitment to working with and supporting the asset owner community uh, on our ESG uh, and SDGs investing journey. So let me just start by um, saying, you know, we know, you know, the biggest issue that we're all confronted with is COVID-19. You know, this crisis has really affected the way that we understand the challenges and the opportunities that have been thrown up by that. I'd be really interested to get your views on how that has impacted the whole issue of sustainable um, infrastructure. Over to you, Jing Dong. Uh, thank you so much, Hubert. Uh, I'm so delighted to meet you virtually. Normally, you and I meet in a city in Africa, in London, where our, uh, you know, common passion for Africa, for our efforts in connecting global savings to infrastructure financing in Africa drives us together. Um, and of course, your question is very relevant and, and the, the, the fact that we have to meet virtually and the World Bank is hosting its annual meeting for the first time virtually really shows the great impact of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Look, COVID-19 started as a health pandemic, but I think very quickly people realized the unprecedented devastation, not only to the health, but social and economic uh, 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 life of, uh, of the whole, uh, the whole uh, world economy. Um, now, I'm, I'm conscious I'm addressing asset owners and CFA, New York asset owners, certainly is a key part of global savings that uh, plays a huge role in de determining the future of the world economy. And, uh, you know, in a sense, the, the, the future of humanity. So in that sense, the, this is a very important uh, 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 event that you organize. So certainly a very much... Uh, Delighted that uh, that you invited me to share some of our thoughts. So um, you know, at the onset of the the annual meeting, our president uh, uh, actually highlighted some of the the devastation. And let me just find some numbers. Yeah, the first number is that uh, uh, by next year, we estimate uh, between 110 to 115 million people would have been falling into extreme poverty that is uh, under 1.9 dollars a day that is the first time poverty has increased in a whole generation uh, 1.6 billion children are locked out of school in developing countries therefore depriving them of the opportunity to receive a regular education so they can become productive force uh, when they grow up now, when it comes to the world of finance, I think the situation is even more, uh, 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 you know, challenging. Look, I would say in Europe and in the United States, in spite of all the problems, uh, you know, European and U.S. government and their central banks have been able to 
come up with stimulus packages worth trillions of euros and trillions of dollars. What about the more than 100 countries that don't have that resources? And for, that, for the time being, private sector investors are actually taking money out of it, right? So that impact is really devastating. I'll give you a couple of examples. A global remittance is a major source of financing for many developing countries. So remittance to developing countries is over 100 billion a year. And we predict probably the drop, given many of the overseas workers have lost their jobs, uh, it could be over more than 20%. That's $20 billion less going to developing countries. And you, you and I know that many African countries rely on exporting commodities, right? Commodity prices have really dropped because global supply chain manufacturing activities have dropped. That's another lost revenue. Uh, one more thing, Hubert, and this is very familiar to you, is that many African governments over the past 15 years has been able to tap the euro bond market, right? The price may be a little more expensive compared with financing from the World Bank, Yet, those governments are well on its path to establish, establish their own credit rating, their own independent access to international bond market. That has also been stopped, right? So really, I think uh, the devastation, whether it's health, social, economic, is, is really very severe. And they lack the central bank, a government fiscal space, to rapidly come up with uh, additional financing. And this is where I'm, I have to say I'm very proud that the World Bank Group uh, in early March, working with our shareholders, very quickly came up with a, a global package of $160 billion of financing in the next 15 months to help countries to cope with the immediate uh, crisis, but also as, as we wanted to focus this conversation on, in addition to the immediate relief, uh, we will also focus on restructuring and, and eventually uh, a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient recovery. And that would demand even more infrastructure financing, which has to be uh, deployed uh, in supporting those countries uh, in the renewed effort. So I think this, the situation is pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, 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 challenging, given we are still in the acute stage of uh, coping with the, with the health and, and pandemic-related issues. But I think I'm glad we are already planning to help countries on the second and third stage. And we'll come back to talk about some of the most specific areas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jing Dong, for really setting the scene there. I don't think anyone um, is not going to be able to relate to everything that you have, have just said. And from the asset owner community side, we are looking at many different ways um, to be able to play our, our, our role responsibly um, and contribute towards the, the, the Build Back Better agenda through our capital and knowing its impact. And, um, you know, as we know, the, the you know, infrastructure is, is a key part of that particular uh, conversation, which is why we've uh, launched this framework here today um, that addresses that and creates alignment with the uh, with the SDGs, um, you know, and, and tapping into the highest compliance and best uh, ESG practice at the same time to measure impact. But I'd like your views, if we could just go into a bit more detail, because, you know, we all know that the, 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 that infrastructure plays a key role in enabling um, economic growth. But I'd like your views on what does this really mean in the context of addressing the key pressing social issues of the Global Development Agenda 2030, in your opinion? Over to you, Jingdong. Yeah, the World Bank Group is, uh, is, uh, is fully committed in supporting the United Nations SDG goals. Among many goals which we work on, you know, the focus of the World Bank is the twin goals of eradicating poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And now with poverty level actually increasing, that job is even more urgent. But let's uh, not forget the long-term goal is really to lift in the bottom 40% of the world's population, not only out of poverty, but so remote from poverty. That's what we call build shared prosperity, right? Uh, so that, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will make progress 
also on addressing inequality. Infrastructure is truly key in everything we do in addressing poverty. Give you a couple of examples, right? Uh, just uh, Uber, just imagine if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, I couldn't imagine the, the, the digital infrastructure would have been robust enough so that business continues. We're talking about developed world, the fact that we are doing a virtual meeting. And it is because of digital infrastructure, many kids in developed country continue benefit from being able to access online education, go to school virtually and everything. What about the 1.6 billion children uh, in developing world? If there had been infrastructure, whether it's broadband, whether it's 4G, 5G, whether it's basic telecom, so on and so forth, that already tells that uh, infrastructure is critical. Another factor, of course, is logistics, right? Now, in the United States with Amazon, you know, even though people are locked down, the, the road transport infrastructure is such that you can order online and get your things delivered right away. But we cannot say of, of those same conditions in many developing countries. So here, you know, I can share some numbers, right? So 840 million people live more than two kilometers from all weather roads. You know, nobody would deliver anything to them. One billion people still lack electricity, and four billion people lack internet access. Even in Kenya, as, as we say, you know, with M-Pesa, Kenya is way ahead of the other African countries when it comes to, you know, financial inclusion. But it is a 2G technology, as you know, right? And uh, therefore, smartphone, higher bandwidth, where you can study, you can learn, that is still lacking. I, I, I read somewhere, maybe from Africa investors, that even outside of South Africa, even the highest penetration of smartphone in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, no more than 20% of all the funds, where in the United States, I'm sure it's 80, 90, if not 100%. So I'm just using this example to showcase infrastructure is fundamental to uh, you know, any society if they have a chance to escape poverty and for people to avail of opportunities for employment, for entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you something else, which is uh, very interesting. In Nigeria, almost 40% of food produced are actually wasted. Globally, about a third of all food produced are wasted. And that waste alone actually generates 8% of the total carbon emission of the world. It's, it's fascinating. And this is an area that not a lot of people actually know, right? Now, what does 8% represent? If food waste is a country, its carbon emission would be only the third largest country after the United States and China. If it is yeah. an industry sector, it would be the third largest emitter after energy and transport. Now, how do we address this? Actually, the World Bank found that having great roads, having cold storage and logistics, right, would sharply reduce food waste. That itself is critical infrastructure, right? You know, food waste is such an outrageous situation where one in 11 people in the world still suffer from hunger and malnutrition. So, you know, there are so many, so many elements to infrastructure that is deficient in developing countries. And I, you and I can spend an hour, two hours to talk about it, but I hope just these, you know, couple of examples could showcase the urgent need. And of course, I'll come back to sustainability, why resilience, sustainability is important later on. But let me just stop here. Uh, so that we can move to the next question. Thanks very much, uh, Jingdong. You really uh, made it very clear about the catalytic important role of, of, of infrastructure in terms of uh, economic uh, development and growth. Um, and of course, uh, demonstrating the fact how fundamental it is to uh, achieving most, if not all, of the 
sustainable development goals and overall creating that, that, that positive social impact. However, I'd be very interested to get your views to drill down. I know you've touched on some areas and, and, and we all know that we're very focused um, um, with the whole COVID-19 issue. But there is this other pandemic that, that is quite silent and is ever present called uh, climate change, as we all know. Um, so I'd be very interested to, in the context of that infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, uh, role, um, to get your views on the associated environmental costs that come along with that approach. Yes, thank you, Hubert. Uh, uh, certainly, we're coming to the core of the issue. Uh, you know, climate change is such a, 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 a global concern. Um, it's funny that this year, in this side of, uh, of the continent, we are running out of names for hurricanes, and, and we have to resort to Greek letters and just to show the frequency of natural disasters. And in Asia, which is economically the most active uh, region, every year natural disaster brings more than $100 billion of death devastation uh, to, to the region. So certainly uh, a climate sustainability is something that we all have to be very concerned. Now, uh, there has been a, a, a bit of a dilemma because between infrastructure and climate, uh, sometimes it is complementary, sometimes it is at a crossroad, right? For example, coal-fired uh, power plant provides probably needed electricity, you know, for, for a region or a community to be able to benefit from broadband internet as, and from manufacturing activities. And yet it would add to the global challenge of, um, of uh, carbon emission and climate change. So we really have to be very uh, clear headed in making sure that when we design infrastructure project, sustainability goes to the core. Right, and we all know that Europe has committed to be carbon neutral by 2050, and China just announced that they will become carbon neutral by 2060. Now, because when you do power plants, it's not a you know two year or three year. Okay, I'm going to get to carbon neutral by 2050, and therefore when I build a plant in 2045, I'll start worrying about it. You have to start to worry about it now, right? So how do we make sure renewable energy, new energy sources, whether it's hydropower, whether it's wind farm, solar farm, goes into critical national energy plan now rather than 20 years later? It is really, really very urgent. Now, when it comes to, to natural disaster, it is another thing that we really have to build resilience. I would know because when Asian tsunami happened, uh, you know, where hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives, I was based in Manila working for the Asian Development Bank. I saw the devastation, right? And, uh, you know, uh, from that point on, whether it's tsunami, earthquake, whether it's nuclear power plants being overwhelmed by, by tsunami and therefore producing even more environmental concerns, all of this actually happen with more frequency. So this is why I think in our infrastructure uh, plan in the World Bank group, uh, what we wanted to do is really when every three, four years, when we sit down with countries to uh, map what we call a country partnership framework, we put sustainability, we put climate in the center of our strategy in addressing them. Therefore, renewable energy certainly has become a big part of our our strategic plan. But now, because we're talking to asset owners, I'm the treasurer of the World Bank, where we issue the world's first uh, green bond, you know, I really wanted to give a shout out to you, to the CFA Society. That is where we can collectively raise awareness and then purposefully channel our assets into supporting climate-friendly uh, infrastructure financing, right? This is where we can collectively make a difference. Now, on the other hand, let me also say that infrastructure financing gap is over a trillion dollars a year, right? Numbers differ from one trillion to two trillion a year, but nevertheless, it is a huge number. And, you know, given 
Every government is, is overburdened with their own domestic issues. You can't really rely on public financing to solve all infrastructure finance and funding gap. Therefore, asset owners through, through uh, you know, different asset classes, uh, through the work that we do, how can we make sure that infrastructure financing in developing country become an attractive asset class? Right, mm -hmm. it makes a decent commercial return while also addressing sustainability head on. That is, hey, I'm doing a solar farm, I'm doing a wind farm in a way that provides cheap energy to uh, the local community, but also doing it in a commercially viable way that I can attract global savings to come to me. And this is where our green bond, our SDG bonds play a key role in attracting global savings and then risk transform uh, uh, them into development finance and resources. We can we can drill down on that later on, but let me just stop here and go back to you, Uber. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are great, uh, those, those, those are great examples, but you know, whenever we talk about this, we're never shy of getting down to really unpacking some of the real issues. Um, and as you know, in terms of uh, infrastructure finance, it'd be really great to get your views on the financing challenges um, that you see in terms of promoting sustainable finance um, with the SDGs. Um, there, there are lots of different perceptions about, you know, if you pursue this particular route, as you began to allude to, it impairs commercial uh, returns. Um, it's not necessarily in line with asset owners' uh, mandates, but I think you've had a, a, a very different experience. So it would be great to hear how you see the challenges and, 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 and your um, success stories in terms of overcoming some of those challenges. So over to you, Jingdong. Thank you, Hubert. That's a great question. Look, uh, let me answer them in a couple, uh, a couple of uh, a different, uh, different angle. The first angle is that look for each and every asset owner. You may have five hundred million, a billion, two billion, you know, a trillion, whatever it is, right? Each individual would want to generate alpha uh, for their, you know, for their company or for their entities. However, collectively. We all live in a single planet, right? Mm -hmm. The sustainability of the planet will drive so that it is not really alpha. Collectively, everybody has to earn a beta. That beta has to be that the world becomes a better place, where through smart investing in infrastructure, we build up economic activity, wealth level, for uh, every country in the world. And therefore, all asset owners benefit by the entire world going to a better place, right? So that, you know, at a very macro level, it's funny because uh, when I had a conversation with Mizuno Sound, who used to be the CIO of Japan's government pension fund, and they have a small fund of $1.3 trillion, right? It's too and, and small said, for us to discuss here. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, and uh, you know, he says, I can't really generate uh, uh, alpha. You know, my alpha is a beta for the world, right? Yeah. In the sense that you really have to look at the global sustainability of the, the world becoming a better place. So the first angle is that, you know, for asset owners, you really, we really have to see a better future for the world, a sustainable world as the ultimate return on our investment. That's number one. Number two is indeed, even our work in the World Bank, uh, including my own experiences, both at the World Bank and ISC, when designed well, infrastructure projects in emerging market countries can be profitable while you are also supporting sustainability, right? Uh, you know, recently, about two years ago, I think the World Bank Group worked on a large scale solar farm uh, in Egypt. And the way we did it is really innovative. Uh, a typical approach would be a private sector sponsor from a developed country, a solar farm builder would go to the country, lobby government, you know, to get to secure a power purchasing agreement and to, you know, secure a piece of land or whatever it is. But that is time consuming. And each investor is very concerned with my own ability to, you know, to be successful in that project. What we have done working with the Egyptian government 
is that why don't we holistically look in the next couple of years how many solar farms would be needed for the country mm -hmm. then uh, in one setting, we regularize and standardize a power purchase agreement with the government that is transparent to all private sector investors, right? Then that plan, and I don't remember the actual number, I remember it's uh, 13 solar farms, then go in the open to say, hey, we're going to have 13 solar farms to be built. If you want to come in, I see will be co-financing. The World Bank will be working with the government to make sure regulatory framework is there. And MIGA will provide, you know, political insurance for commercial investors to, to go in. So in this very innovative way, we are able to upscale the infrastructure package from a piecemeal to a holistic approach. And that, you know, when the project was done, I was still in uh, uh, with ISC we were able to syndicate several hundred million dollars from commercial investors that came in and the solar farm produced a per kilowatt uh, price that is very acceptable to the government. So I think there are ways that we can make sure that we provide the enabling environment, uh, uh, reforms of regulatory framework where a renewable energy project can be done in an innovative new finance and package to make it uh, you know achieving all the purpose doing good by doing well doing well by doing good where nobody has to sacrifice their 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 commercial return right on the other hand the third element i wanted to mention is that if we work together private sector public sector international development banks multilateral community bilateral community together to make a country's economic and social progress sustainable in a virtuous cycle, what it means is that risk premium will continue to drop, right? So maybe you think 5% is now, maybe it will go to 4%. So your ongoing project financing will be more valuable down the road. So, so I think what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, work with us, um, you know, uh, through the World Bank Group, through multilateral institutions, where we work with government, we work with private sector to make sure everything we do is sustainable. So I think, uh, you know, I hope that example shows that I don't think sustainability and commercial return necessarily have to be contradictory. We have seen many successes where you can achieve both. Fantastic. No, uh, yeah, spot on there as, as, as ever, uh, uh, Jing Dong. I mean, that's, that, that, that model that you've talked about in, in Egypt um, and the overall approach is one that we share um, and subscribe to from the global asset owners community. And that was in, 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 in large part one of the motivations as to why we thought, let us try to play our role as a key stakeholder in the ecosystem, including governments, um, development finance institutions, multilateral development banks, civil society, and the public sector, by, by really mapping out a framework that not only demonstrates how one can align um, their infrastructure investments, both, both current and, and, and potential, uh, with the SDGs, but also demonstrates how that impact um, can be measured in both financial and, and, and social terms. So, you know, the, the asset owner community, I, can, I, I can't talk highly enough um, about our, our commitment um, in this particular uh, regard to play our full role um, in the pursuit and attainment of the uh, sustainable development goals and the uh, pursuit of the highest levels of ESG standards. Um, but I'd like to get, you know, you've, you've touched on it throughout our, throughout our keynote interview today. Um, but, you know, I'd be really interested if you to just drill down again on, you know, in your view, what is the role of institutional investors and what type of financial instruments are available uh, to mobilize investments into sustainable infrastructure? Okay, Hubert, uh, we're now coming to the nitty gritty and this is an uh, area I love. Uh, so, you know, well, uh, uh, and I like to, at the end, uh, be able to really address uh, uh, ESG. And also I have an additional head in addition uh, to be the, uh, the treasurer of the World Bank. I'm also the head of the World Bank Group Pension, you know, overseeing $30 billion uh, of, uh, of um, assets invested 
in all asset classes from private equity hedge fund to fixed income. So uh, certainly uh, be happy to share our own journey on ESG. Uh, but let me start by saying this, uh, that is, for the world to develop, uh, for especially for developing country, we need each and every asset class, uh, and they address different issues, right? In poor countries, certainly equity is important because equity is a primary source for, for capital formation, for entrepreneurship, for the first stage of, a, of an entrepreneur's idea gets implemented, right? That is the equity space. Now, of course, from angel capital, venture fund, private equity, you know, uh, public equity, IPO, so on and so forth. So that, that's one big bucket of asset classes. And of course, ISC does a lot of that in coin investing through its own balance sheet, uh, private equity, and inviting many, you know, private equity uh, space investors into uh, opportunities in entrepreneurship. Mm. The second big bucket, of course, is project financing, which is loans, right? Unsecured, you know, senior loans, fixed income, so on and so forth. This is where bond market plays a critical role. And I think uh, through our three AAA rated balance sheet, this is the IBRD balance sheet, uh, where I'm the treasurer, uh, where IBRD supports middle income governments uh, in their economic plan. The, uh, the balance sheet of IDA, this is also a part of the World Bank, and I'm the treasurer of IDA, where using bond market, we provide additional resources in addition to replenishment donor money into supporting a 60, 70 poorest country. And yet bond markets start to play a role because we have a AAA rated balance sheet to be tapped into. And of course, ISC issues bonds also in international bond market where through their bond, you know, you can participate in project finance and so on and so forth. And of course, they have a syndicated loan platform. So we have a multitude of platforms where we can provide co-financing opportunity. Now, for the World Bank, just to be sure that our AAA rated bond is a primary source where we connect the international savings into development financing with the government. And there we have been using SDG and green bond as a handle to, first of all, highlight our commitment, raise awareness, and attract more investors into the space, right? So we have two big uh, tickets. One is a green bond. Of course, the World Bank, uh, you know, uh, invented the green bond label in 2008 when we issued the world's first green bond, uh, working with Swedish asset owners and Swedish uh, investment bank. You know, it's a couple of hundred uh, million dollars. And now the green bond market is over a uh, 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 trillion dollars. Uh, in a short space of 12 years. That's an amazing metamorphosis of an idea, uh, you know, now coming into the asset class that is becoming mainstream. So that itself has demonstrated the power, power of, uh, of a somatic bond. And then, you know, we, we started to think how we can mainstream this label into everything we do. And therefore, Every bond the World Bank issues now is called an SDG bond. We actually then, depending on the, 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 the uh, different thematic area, we actually give it a label. It could be a bond, SDG bond, addressing uh, a nutrition for children, or women's health, or food waste, or ocean pollution, right, in addition to the green bond. Now, um, the way we do it, and that's where asset owners, I think uh, collectively we are making it a, a global standard. It's not only by going through investor roadshow, it is in our effort to make sure we bring transparency and the highest global disclosure standard to make sure these are asset classes that are trusted by international investors and asset owners, right? Therefore, of course, on Green Bond, we sit as an executive committee of ECOMA in the green bond standard. The same in terms of SDG bond, we just published the first uh, disclosure report or impact report 
really Italian uh, those asset owners who bought our bond, your money has gone to this, and this is the actual impact. So yeah. maybe a word on IC because in addition to the bond, IC has a syndicated loan platform, right? Where in the fixed income space, uh, uh, away from the AAA rated bond, you can come in and join a syndicated project financing, you know, through if you are more risk tolerant, you can come in as a first loss uh, uh, investor. If you are less risk tolerant, you can be a senior tranche investor. If you wanted to participate in the same risk as I see in project financing, LIBOR plus 400, 500, depending on the credit risk, then you can participate, you know, without going into different tranches, right? That is uh, the asset class you can certainly do. But let me also mention, um, um, before I uh, return the mic to you, is that the World Bank Group, in addition to the project financing we do, there is so much research, there is so much data that we share. That itself is a portal for asset owners to discover opportunities, right? I'll give you a couple examples. We now actually have an ESG you know, data portal where you can click and analyze government data on how each government is committed on ESG and various parameters. We have a global doing business ranking where we show how friendly a country is you know, to private sector. And uh, we actually actively work with government to do reform. And Hoover, you and I know that in Africa, Rwanda is a fantastic example, jumping from the bottom of the pack when it comes to friendliness to private sector to one of the top, one of the top performers in doing business, right? So this global standard setting, disclosure, transparency, in addition to actual finance and goes into the country, it is really the whole package that the World Bank Group uh, uh, provides uh, that asset owners can take advantage of, uh, you know, when partnering with them. Back to you. Thank you, uh, Jingdong. You've really, uh, you've really helped us understand your journey and your commitment um, both at the uh, both at the individual level as well as at the institutional level about integrating and being innovative and creating products and and we certainly uh, you know as the asset owner community uh, felt it was very important that we tried to come up with our you know our, our ability to almost take the data and create what might be described as infratech data that can be used by multiple different parties for different um, reasons that can actually have um, a real development um, outcome or, or, or support analysis to, to forge towards the pursuit of the sustainable development goals. So you've talked about it from the side of the sort of the, the World Bank, um, you know, but I'd be, be in closing, you know, I'd really be interested to get your recommendations to asset owners that are interested in following their own sort of integration of sustainability journey, um, especially in the context of your special area being that sustainable finance into, into the investment portfolios. Just, you know, what journey is recommended? We, we at the framework level will be taking existing data from some of your sources, uh, you know, the, the work that a number of the fund managers or the investment managers or the project developers or the governments are doing. But it'll be really interesting to get your views and recommendations to, to our community of asset owners, you know, about how to sort of integrate that sustainability um, and sustainable finance uh, into, in, into our investment portfolios and approach. Over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Hubert. Uh, so uh, in this regard, I, I switched my role from treasurer of the World Bank, mm -hmm. the head of the World Bank Group Pension. And also, uh, for your information, I have been sitting on the Pension Finance Committee, which is equivalent to the board of the pension for the past 10 years. I okay. certainly was part of the board that made that progress from mm -hmm. having non-ESG, uh, yeah, our pension investment, to fully embracing ESG as critical factors we consider. So, 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 uh, so let me uh, walk that journey a little bit. You know, I, I, I think uh, we are very happy that we have now established the ESG integration approach that aims to identify, measure, and manage material ESG risk in the uh, entire investment process. And we, we, we firmly believe that proper, objective, and well-informed ESG integration 
should enable investors to price in not only idiosyncratic ESG risks related to a particular asset, but also broader negative social and environmental externalities, right? So to the extent that we can achieve that, we could see impact investing and ESG integration converging in the long term in an ideal scenario. So what is, what is necessary for us to get there? Um, as, as you said, you know, data and disclosure as a cornerstone that can enable investors to ensure that ESG integration efforts are in alignment with the sustainability goal of the SDG and the climate accord. So, you know, how, how do we then collectively, you know, consider promoting greater and better ESG disclosure in companies and cooperation with our public and private portfolio is a, you know, a journey we are all walking, you know, through to get to a, to a better place, right? You know, for the World Bank uh, Group Pension, you know, we certainly are currently in the process of uh, incorporating this as a key goal of our ESG integration in the due diligence process and through engagement with our external asset managers. And this is also a key objective of our corporate engagement plan with our responsible ownership approach. So I certainly would welcome more efforts uh, to provide investors with tools to understand the underlying impact of their portfolio. And I believe that a thorough understanding of such impact, both negative and positive, will lead us all not only to have more transparent and reliable impact investing and reporting framework, but also enable a more meaningful and effective ESG integration process. So with regard to infrastructure as an asset class, we have noted a significant progress in the approach that asset managers are undertaken to integrate material ESG risks and to report on the management ESG issues within their portfolio. So among the key best practice we observe and, and we try to practice, I can mention the following, right? So adopt Adoption of a formal ESG policy that clearly outlines, uh, in particular, the firm's ESG integration approach, responsibility and reporting lines with regard to ESG, the firm's responsible ownership approach, and how it objectively manages ESG issues at the portfolio company level, and commitment to regular reporting and disclosure. Now, on ESG integration, you know, do we have well-documented, systematic, consistent consideration of relevant ESG issues in the investment uh, uh, analysis uh, and the objective identification and measurement of material ESG risks associated with an investment opportunity, which should be in line with internationally recognized principles, standards, or criteria? When it comes to responsible ownership, you know, do, do, do we have formal, relevant, and consistent KPIs assigned to each portfolio company that can enable tracking progress against core sustainability performance goals and, and, and to make sure that to nurture and promote good corporate governance that is conducive to proper management of relevant ESG risk and improve sustainability performance? and also to promote corporate reporting and disclosure on case sustainability and ESG metrics. Now, finally, our reporting and disclosure, we certainly would strongly uh, encourage infrastructure asset managers to adopt a formal, consistent, and timely reporting on their ESG work program, a sustainability effort. So regular annual reports at investors' meetings and through other appropriate channels. So, you know, understanding how all these efforts connect with the SDGs is a welcome development. And I'm sure this will allow institutional investors and asset owners to increase their capacity to integrate sustainability in a more structured and consistent manner in their uh, investment process. So we are walking that journey ourselves and very happy to have a continuous dialogue. And the fact that we have dedicated ESG staff on our pension plan showcases you know our strong commitment and certainly uh, as we make progress very happy to have a continuous uh, sharing with asset owners and uh, through the great work that you do so hubert back to you
Thank you very much, Jing Dong. That was a, you know, a, a really inspiring uh, keynote interview. Um, I'm now going to turn to Mr. Aurelian Reynolds, who's a key part of the framework technical team, um, to give us a presentation um, as the formal launch and unveiling of the framework. Over to you, Aurelian. Thank you very much, Hubert. So I will start off with presenting the SDG ESG Infrastructure Investment Framework and what it is. So this framework identifies the SDGs relevant to infrastructure assets and projects and defines cases and associated conditions for which an SDG contribution statement can be made. It is a first step in facilitating better reporting against the SDGs for infrastructure assets and projects. And institutional investors and the trustees have a fiduciary duty to the trust and are required to manage the trust assets solely in the interest of participants and beneficiaries. And in the case of traditional portfolio management theory, uh, essentially the theory is about making the case for the universal ownership approach under which investors are viewed as holding a slice of the whole global economy and capital markets through their portfolios. They can therefore improve their long-term financial performance acting in such a way so as to encourage healthy and stable economies and markets. Now, while ESG data can be reported and used in various forms, presenting data in terms of SDG contribution can be really understood because the SDGs are simple, clear, and universally accepted. So how can this framework be used? Now, we have several use cases for this framework, but we have essentially identified a generic, generic use case, which I'll run through shortly. But first, let's look at the usage more generally. There are several different investment strategies available to enable institutional investors to take account of ESG factors in their portfolio construction as outlined in the responsible investment spectrum. An SDG contribution report can be a valuable input to investment decision making, regardless of the approach to responsible investment. For example, a positive contribution statement from the framework might be most useful in best in class screening and sustainability themed investing. A negative contribution statement from the framework might be most useful in negative and normal space screening. All of the statements are considered useful for ESG integration and corporate engagement. In regards to impact investing, positive contribution statements provide suggestions of potential areas for targeted impact investing. In regards to due diligence, positive contribution statements provide information about the benefits of a project or asset. The negative contribution statements provide information about risks described in terms of the potential impact to stakeholders. Opportunity statements provide information about potential project asset opportunities. In regards to stewardship, positive contribution statements provide an opportunity to recognize the ongoing benefits of these improving year on year. Negative contribution statements of the framework, again, provide information about risks described in terms of a potential impact to stakeholders. Are these risks being managed and can they be eliminated? The opportunity statements provide information about potential project asset opportunities. Are these opportunities being pursued? What progress is being made to turn them into positive contributions? And finally, in regards to training, it can help to better understand infrastructure as an investment asset class, and it can quickly identify potential positive and negative contribution or impacts relevant to particular sectors. In regards to reporting, it can be important, it can be an input to annual reporting, including sustainability reports on websites and stakeholder engagement processes and media releases. Now, we, how is this framework unique and how does it stand out from others? Now, we recognize that other initiatives exist out there. For example, the Gen Iris provides an informational platform and database on metrics that can be used to report on the SDGs by impact categories, but it is not specific to infrastructure and does not provide a generic way to report a contribution to the SDGs. The SDG Action Manager that came out earlier this year is a successful tool for SDG reporting. However, the sectors it covers do not encompass infrastructure assets only oil and gas. The UNPRI Bridging the Gap focuses on infrastructure investment approach to the SDGs. However, it does not provide a framework for infrastructure asset owners to report on the SDGs. Furthermore, many standards and initiatives have mapped the SDGs to their own indicators, but typically only at the goal level and not in a fully transparent manner. This framework is unique in that it is transparent and infrastructure specific, allowing asset owners to identify how they can contribute to and ultimately impact the SDGs 
using ESG data at the SDG target and indicator level. Now, I'll move on to a sort of six-step process that our framework can use. Now, the first is to identify the SDGs that are potentially relevant to the asset or project. The second is to obtain the necessary ESG data to compare against the relevant conditions necessary for a contribution statement. If all conditions are satisfied for a case, then record the relevant contribution statement. We then can copy all relevant contribution statements to an SDG contribution report and then add any important assumptions and details about the source data. Finally, report number six, use, we can use the report to communicate with stakeholder and as an input to decision making. The framework itself uses dimension from the impact management project, notably the who, the what, the how much, and ultimately the contribution to an SDG target or indicator. By way of example, target 9.1 is a material indicator to which an asset could contribute to. The what dimension identifies the necessary conditions under which an asset could contribute to the SDGs. These factors or conditions include the infrastructure sector of the asset, its life cycle stage, for example, whether it is in operation or in development, and materiality, which is based on asset characteristics, such as location or if the asset has employees. The who dimension identifies the stakeholders that are affected by the SDG impact. This could be the local community, employees, or even the planet. But how much indicates what necessary ESG data is needed from the asset to justify its contributions towards an SDG. ESG data types can be qualitative, such as a policy or risk assessment, or quantitative, such as tons of CO2. The time scope relates to whether the data needed is of a reporting year or whether past year data is also needed in the case of an increase or decrease of impact. If the conditions from what and how much have been fulfilled, only then can a unique contribution statement towards an SDG be made. The type of contribution can be either make a contribution, have the opportunity to make a contribution, or in some cases, make a negative contribution. Now here we have an example of a framework itself and how to use it. As a first step, I select, for instance, the sector relevant to my asset using the filter. I also select the materiality characteristics of the assets and its life cycle stage used and life cycle stage. Now that filters have been applied, there is now an overview of ESG data needed to generate a contribution statement. And the asset can check whether this data is available and whether there are any gaps. Finally, through these steps, the asset can identify the SDG targets and indicators it can contribute to or could contribute to. Now, another process that is in place is essentially um, how the asset can collect, translate, and report the data. The framework itself provides a foundation, and I will exemplify how the asset owner could or would typically use the framework for the collection of material ESG data, the translation and application of the framework, and finally, reporting the contribution to the SDGs. So as a way of example, the SG data types in the framework are globally recognized and represent the structure industry standards as displayed on the above example of a non wide ESG reporting platform. So the first step consists of a collection of material ESG data, which can be done either internally or through the use of ESG reporting platforms. Here's an example of an ESG reporting platform, for example, that can be used. A second step, once the typical ESG data gathering process has taken place, the asset owner needs to apply and translate the SDG ESG impact framework based on its current ESG reporting practices. One way to do this is, of course, to map the different applicable contribution statements to the assets, current reporting ESG practices, using the recognized framework as a basis. And the third and final step is to report the contribution to the SDGs. Now, the report, once generated, will consist of all the contributions, positive, negative, and potential of the asset on the SDG targets and indicators. The report can then be used, communicated to investors, shareholders, and other stakeholders uh, using a recognized and standardized approach and bring the world one step to achieving the sustainable development goals. 
And this brings us now to our Brain Trust Industry Leaders panel. To you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Aurelian, for that, for that presentation. Let me say again, many congratulations to, to, to you and the technical team and the, and the Brain Trust for all your tireless efforts to, to bring us to this point where you've been able to unveil um, what is a really valuable contribution. When you consider um, the market and the different initiatives that are taking place, and as Jing Donghua pointed out, the massive infrastructure deficit and infrastructure investment required to meet the sustainable development goals and the fact that there you can count um, frameworks that can talk of this nature on probably less than one hand um, and even fewer fingers than that if you're talking about globally um, being able to do this. We think that this is a very valuable contribution uh, to the market. So thank you and your team again. I'm now going to turn to our brain uh, trust and industry that leads uh, launch um, of the uh, framework panel. We have a number of uh, industry heads and brain trust members who will be sharing um, their views. But first of all, we're just going to ask them to introduce themselves, their organization, and then just give a perspective about how they would see this valuable tool um, being applied within their own um, organizations and uh, the, the, broader, the broader ecosystem. So on this particular panel, we have, um, I'll just introduce the speakers. Uh, we have Rick Waters, who is the director for infrastructure at Grez. We have Duncan Bonfield, who is the CEO of the International Federation of Sovereign Wealthfonds. We have Francois Berger, who is the Executive Director for the Long Term Infrastructure Investors Association. We have Charlotte Cyril Drake, who is the Director for Pensions for Purpose. We have Mr. John uh, Phillips, who is the Director for Corporate Affairs, the Global Infrastructure Investment Association. And we have uh, Fraser Hughes, who is the CEO of the Global Listed Infrastructure um, Organization. So I'm going to now turn to uh, Rick to give us um, his, uh, his remarks by way of introducing his organization and how he sees uh, Grace being able to support and use um, uh, the framework. Over to you, uh, Rick. Thanks, Hubert. Um, great start to the session. Um, very pleased to uh, to be here and to represent Grez. We, uh, we are ESG benchmarking for infrastructure. We've been doing that for five years and, and in fact, 10 years for real estate. Uh, we are currently up to this year 426 assets reporting, 118 funds, and, and through that, by being a buy industry for industry initiative, we've been recognised as the global benchmark for ESG for infrastructure. We're mission driven, investor led. We have over 100 institutional investors behind us as a membership, and they in total represent over 22 trillion in assets under management, not all in infrastructure. Uh, but that shows the size of our support base. Um, interesting number I wanted to share. I just heard just before this, uh, this, this session that the, the year 2082 was quoted to me. And that is the year that it's expected that we'll reach this, achieve the sustainable development goals based on current progress, which has been dented by the COVID crisis. So our 2030 that we're meant to we're trying to achieve these sustainable development goals, it's currently looking like 2082 on current rates of progress. So obviously we need to improve. And this is one tool, one framework to help on that regard. So GRESP is right behind this, and that's why we've been happy to contribute our resources to, to getting to this point of the launch. And the ways that we have identified that we can help is we, we already collect the CSG data for the industry. And so that's a, that's a good start. You, you need that ESG data to then translate into SDG terms. So we do that for all of our members and we're scaling that up to do that for the whole industry. So we plan to use this framework on top of that raw ESG data to translate into translate that data into SDG contribution statements for each GRES participant and potentially the industry. 
uh, as a, so a way of making what are very sort of um, dry ESG data figures into much more interesting, much more compelling stories about the sustainable development goals and a contribution towards them. Uh, then we plan to be able to provide a report for the assets that participate in GRES on that SDG contribution. So all of the 426 and growing number of assets will be able to then get an SDG contribution report. That's the plan that we're heading towards and why we've been happy to uh, participate. Um, our reporting is an annual process, so this can be done annually. So it provides a great way of updating regularly. Um, in terms of how we want to share and, and promote this further, we will share this with our membership base and we'll promote it in our newsletters and events and the like. You know, we really want to get the word out there that this is here now and it's something that the whole industry can share and use. So building that awareness and this is the start of that today. So glad to be involved and glad to be able to use this in, uh, in our work at Gres. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. And, um, you know, whilst it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, we really appreciate this impressive support, it's uh, quite a dampening uh, projection, that number, in terms of the impact that COVID's had on the SDGs. So, uh, so uh, we certainly have our, have our work cut out, but I think if there's any a constituency um, or group of leaders that represent the industry and the largest asset owners on the planet, um, I think they are already part of this um, initiative. And I and I'm going to turn to one of them now, um, Duncan uh, Bonfield, the CEO of the International Federation of Sovereign Wealth Funds, um, to give um, his uh, remarks. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you very much, Hubert, uh, and thank you to uh, Aurelian and to uh, Rick. Um, the IFSWF is a network of the world's leading sovereign wealth funds. Um, they control uh, some five uh, plus trillion uh, dollars worth of investment and they invest all over the world. And what we do as a, an organization is help those members to network, share knowledge and also to collaborate. And I think that's where the uh, the whole framework comes in as something that is really going to be fairly fundamental in terms of uh, the SDGs and infrastructure investment, especially in direct investment that these sovereign wealth funds do. Um, just a couple of points I want to make about it. I guess one is that what is really great to see here is the lessons that have been learned from uh, climate change and uh, uh, investment around climate change, where that took quite a long time to come together, whereas, uh, and even now it's quite disparate in some of the initiatives and the approaches. This seems to me to be a really um, far-sighted uh, opportunity and, and uh, action to try and get ahead of that and to try and bring some order to investment in infrastructure. And I think for sovereign wealth funds, there's, there's really three ways that uh, they can look at using this. The first is around alignment. And I think that's really about using the framework uh, to consider how to build financial risks around the SDGs into their decision making policies, you know, subject to the usual sovereign wealth fund uh, investment horizons. Uh, and then I think they the aim is to then uh, use the framework to integrate uh, the, and the principles to integrate into new uh, and existing investment uh, policies. And then within those sovereign wealth funds, there's the opportunity to use the framework to educate and train employees about the SDGs. I think that's where that's a key point is we mustn't assume there's a universal knowledge even within investment funds about the SDGs uh, themselves. So uh, I think the framework is very useful um, from that perspective. As over time, as the framework gets more used, uh, we'll, we will share information among our members uh, around the framework and how it's been put into use. Then the second uh, element will be around ownership. And I think that's going to be both uh, via asset managers. So how can we um, engage with asset managers using this framework and encouraging asset managers uh, to use some of the uh, principles and approaches within that. So to give a, a, a standard approach to investment. And sovereign wealth funds have quite a lot of influence here, quite clearly. They write a lot of mandates uh, in a lot of territories, a lot of geographies. So there's quite a, a significant element they can, uh, they can do in, in that. 
Uh, we've heard from uh, Rick already about um, uh, benchmarking. Um, uh, so I think that's another important area. So how the framework is used for benchmarking, uh, benchmarking standards and agencies. And then there's direct investment by sovereign wealth funds with large asset owners, large investors uh, in infrastructure. And they can use this uh, framework directly to assess their those uh, uh, investments. Um, and then the third approach, the third element would be integration. So that's a, a more of a, um, a, a forward looking approach. So start to integrate um, the consideration of the um, sustainable development goals into the risks and opportunities uh, around their investment management. So, uh, uh, and I think you'll see you'll see a, a multi-speed approach from sovereign wealth funds. But I think the early adopters, uh, and we've seen this before in, with regards to climate change, will really start to try and push that about how they can really integrate the, the framework into their infrastructure investment and really make an assessment of their uh, investment policies and portfolios going forward using that framework. Thank you, uh, Duncan. That's really uh, very practical and very positive, and we, and we very much look forward to working with you as part of the, the phase two. And um, you know, your, we've, I've had the, the, the opportunity to interact a number of times with your, your, your a number of members from all around the world, and it's going to be really useful and valuable for us to, as you say, collaborate, look at the integration issues, and then begin to see how we can generate some of that local localized data. Um, as we iterate and advance this particular project. So thank you very much for, for not only that inter intervention there, but of course you're part of the CFA Global Asset Owners Advisory Council and you've always been um, you know, very much available to provide input and thank you for, for, for your um, support and uh, collaboration with this. I'm now going to move um, to Francois. Uh, thank you, um, Hubert. Thanks to all, all the participants. Yes, indeed, LTIA uh, brings together institutional investors that collectively manage close to uh, uh, 300, $350 billion in infrastructure assets. And as its name implies, uh, it, 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 it really about sharing a long-term DNA about, uh, among those investors. That's really the sort of unifying dimension among, among our members, facilitating and promote uh, investment in infrastructure, uh, which enables long-term sustainable development. So in a way, there's already a very uh, favorable ground, uh, I would say, to uh, consider and adopt and promote any initiative that goes in that direction towards uh, uh, well, promoting and communicating uh, around these issues of uh, sustainable development. As it happens, we uh, conducted a survey uh, just a few months ago as part of our uh, newly released ESG handbook among our members, so typically asset owners and asset managers, uh, 40 of them all together uh, around their expectations. Uh, and uh, I guess it was very clear in showing that there was a shared appetite uh, <laughs> uh, to improve the uh, communication, and not just the reporting, but the communication uh, uh, to stakeholders and member of third parties around what they're doing in in terms of ESG and do so as much as possible uh, with a, a common language. Uh, they're, they're definitely looking for and expecting and uh, striving for a more sort of common language uh, to communicate uh, whatever developments or achievements uh, they are uh, embarking on uh, with regard to sustainable development. So uh, on both of these accounts, I would think this initiative comes uh, very time uh, it, it brings the kind of uh, clarity and simplicity that uh, would be, uh, I think, key ingredients to uh, favor taking on board this type of uh, uh, reporting framework by uh, members. Uh, uh, and again, uh, there's strong appetite there. We witnessed it just last week again as part of the uh, ongoing debates that we held at the Paris Infrastructure Week uh, session. So um, strong expectations 
questions how we're we going to proceed well that the usual way we do uh, with uh, our members which would be to of course communicate through uh, our website our newsletter but also uh, try and uh, set up a uh, sort of working stream a working group of the most concerned members uh, uh, and indeed some of our members have already embarked on SDG reporting uh, let me just mention Mary Gamstoa as uh, just a few of them. Uh, so set up that uh, working group and and share the 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 the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, best practices, uh, uh, promote uh, the the latest uh, developments uh, in particular from uh, this initiative, and make sure it is uh, uh, well well known and disseminated uh, among our members. Obviously, the the choice to report or not will be theirs at the end of the day but we can definitely push this and promote this through our uh, working group through our uh, channels of communication and make sure at the very least all of our members are fully aware and and uh, can effectively uh, sort of realize that the, the benefits that come with uh, adopting such a, a framework to communicate and report on their uh, investments so uh, uh, I guess it's a, a commitment uh, in terms of means, not result, uh, but certainly something uh, we will uh, pursue uh, over the coming uh, months and, and year. As a matter of fact, I did mention this initiative just last week during our, our AGM to our members, so they, they should already be aware of the, uh, the general direction of travel and will now sort of pursue with the, uh, the actual methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. And again, um, your, your, your very detailed insights um, as part of that consultative process. And um, of course, um, please send our, our best wishes to your, your chairman, Thierry Doe. And we know that his leadership um, alongside yours um, is really going to be a valuable uh, contribution to our members and the broader institutional infrastructure investment community might find utility um, within within the the framework. Um, so I'm now going to move to Charlotte. Thank you, Hubert. We're an independent thought leader in ESG sustainable and impact investment. We were set up in 2017 on behalf of and, and with collaboratively with um, investment consultants and asset managers there are about 90 influencer members in terms of assets under management and then we also have affiliate members who are institutional investors around 115 of those um, the majority of which are put and local government pension schemes so um, significant um, clout in terms of assets we empower pension funds to help them clarify their impact goal, crystallize what their options are, and then make those investments happen. We do that through training. So we help them to determine the that they want to contribute to, for example, and to also understand the positive and negative impacts they're having across their portfolio. Um, so this plays very much into exactly what we are um, all about and what our mission is. And we are currently working in partnership with the Impact Investing Institute to launch a set of good governance principles on impact investing for trustees. That will help them to determine um, how they want to set about putting together investment beliefs on the sustainable development goals and particular impacts, how they interact with their investment consultants and managers, um, how they deploy those investments and how they measure those investments. As part of that, we're looking for supplementary materials and frameworks. So we will be adding this to um, that, that those principles as a framework that trustees, investment consultants and managers can use in order to uh, move forward in terms of redirecting capital towards um, impact investing. Um, so the SDG framework, ESG SDG framework will be incredibly ha helpful as a work reviewed on an ongoing basis for a particular asset class. Um, I think being able to review positive and negative impacts is also incredibly important and being able to add it to a stewardship policy and activity um, also adds to it. Um, the 
the key thing that we've been lacking in this area is it's been a huge amount of fragmentation, which has been alluded to. And this provides a universal language and framework for investors and intermediaries. And I think that's really, really key. As the current debate on the ESG requirements from the UK government has shown, there can often be a misalignment between the expectations and goals of the investor and then what the asset managers are being compelled to do. And a framework like this that's taken on by the whole chain um, of investors, I think, will really help move the needle and hopefully change the, the, the projected outcome in terms of uh, the year by which we can achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Charlotte. Uh, really, really great to have your support and uh, input. And, um, and I think you've touched on two very, very important points that, uh, that, that were incredibly helpful um, to us. The first was to make it incredibly um, user friendly and simple, and it was on the back of, and you know, uh, but, you know based on a lot of the suggestions that you uh, and Pensions for Purpose provided, um, helping us understand the importance of ensuring that there's a user guide that can be useful to trustees, um, and helping us think more laterally to all of the players in the value chain, including the consultants and the asset managers. Um, uh, not just uh, solely um, the asset uh, owners. So thank you very much for that. And we look forward to working closely with you um, to take the framework's implementation across that uh, ecosystem forward. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to move to our other Brain Trust, uh, Brain Trust uh, collaborator and supporter, uh, Mr. John uh, Phillips, who is the Director for Corporate Affairs um, at the Global Infrastructure Investors Association. Uh, over to you, John. Thanks, Hubert, and good to be involved uh, with you again today. Um, so, yeah, I'm the Corporate Affairs Director for the Global Infrastructure Investor Association. Um, that's a member organization that was created back in 2016 uh, with uh, about 25 of the leading uh, infrastructure investors from around the world. Uh, we've actually grown uh, in that time now to uh, around 80 members, uh, and uh, our members have in the region of 800 billion um, of uh, infrastructure assets under management um, across 55 countries around the world. That's about 1,500 individual assets. Um, so uh, we talk for a pretty large proportion of the uh, specialist in infrastructure investor community. Um, our role uh, at GIIA is to try and make the case for private investment in infrastructure uh, and to promote improved understanding and dialogue between governments, uh, regulators um, and investors in order to try and create the right framework um, uh, and env environment for uh, that successful um, delivery of infrastructure. In order to be successful, uh, we need to be able to tell evidence-based stories uh, about how privately owned and operated infrastructure can and is uh, making a positive contribution to communities, uh, economies, uh, and uh, the environment. Um, Many of our members uh, are, of course, al already using tools, um, um, especially tools such as GRESB, to satisfy their management and uh, investor reporting requirements. Um, and that, of course, is extremely important. But we're trying to encourage them to go th to the next step, which is uh, to work with us to start to tell a broader story uh, about the positive contribution uh, that those investments are making and to tell that story to a wider set of stakeholders than they traditionally are focused on. So this is where the importance of the SDGs comes in uh, and, and this framework. Um, so we've been uh, developing a number of case studies um, for, taken from within our member, membership, um, uh, and which are all posted on our website, by the way. Um, uh, and the aim is to try and showcase uh, investments that have a particularly strong ESG component uh, to their story, and then to map those uh, against the uh, relevant SDGs. And that's just a starting point. We recognize it's, um, it's not a, a, a thorough kind of assessment in, in the way that uh, this framework ultimately points towards, but it's a starting point. 
Um, and through our, our uh, ESG working group, uh, we will continue to develop these case studies. But 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 I think our next step in in terms of telling that story uh, uh, and something that I've been discussing with uh, with Rick um, from Gresby is whether we are are going to be able to try and paint a picture uh, on behalf of the cumulative uh, effort of our members. A number many of our members overlap with with Gresb in terms of uh, uh, commonality, and and um, so we're going to try and explore. I think between us. Uh, how we can tell that story uh, of the collective picture uh, of infrastructure global investors uh, against the SDG framework, um, and I think that if we're successful in that, I think that will really go a long way to try and uh, demonstrate to people uh, about the power of the story that uh, that we can tell on behalf of the sector. So I think um, you know I, I, I mentioned this on previous uh, call, uh, Hubert. I mean, from GIA's point of view, uh, it is important to make the point that uh, you know our members are looking for simplification, standardisation, and harmonisation of, of of this in increasingly complex world of reporting. Um, and um, you know there is a concern um, that um, you know there is a plethora of requirements on investors. Uh, what, what, what I like about this uh, initiative is that it builds on something that is already there and, and fundamentally in place. Um, uh, you know, and if you are uh, already subscribing to the GRESB assessment, then this framework, I think, uh, is relatively easy to, to then build on, that, on the work that you're already doing. Uh, uh, and to take it to that next step um, and translate the data that you're already collecting and reporting into something that tells this bigger story. Uh, and that's where we think that the, the real value is. And we look forward to uh, to sharing uh, the this latest development uh, with our ESG working group that's meeting next month. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, we look forward with interest to, to gauge uh, the levels of interest and buy-in from members. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, John. And, uh, you know, we're already seeing some great collaboration, you know, across our Brain Trust members, which is something that we want to be able to facilitate. And so we're very pleased um, about the, the, the work that you're doing and you're already looking at those linkages uh, with GRESP. And I'm sure, you know, there will be many other, uh, you know, many other sort of representatives from the Asset Owners Advisory Council or the Brain Trust um, that, that, that will hopefully be taking um, a, a, a similar um, approach. I think one of the things that the World Bank, um, you know, as we, as we talk about this during the World Bank and launch this during the World Bank um, annual uh, meetings, is the, is the message that it sends about the commitment of asset owners to the not only ESG best practice, but as we know, when you when you need to apply um, an approach that is in line with and demonstrates a contribution towards the SDGs, that completely takes any form or discussion or potential discussion ESG washing uh, off the table and demonstrates that this uh, uh, community of ours. Um, is is not only committed to the highest standards um, of, of of ESG best practice as it relates to um, real assets and infrastructure, um, but in addition to that, we're also uh, committed to innovating and pioneering um, and, and and popularizing the uh, sustainable development uh, uh, goals. So, very much looking forward to working with you on this cross industry initiative. To, to, to raise the standards and, and really see how we as the industry can responsibly, you know, make that contribution to hopefully bring that 2080 or, or you know, two or so year, um, you know, target, as Rick mentioned in, in, in his remarks, down so we can really accelerate and, and play, our, uh, play a positive role to, 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 to you know, accelerating the pursuit and, and delivery of the uh, sustainable development goals. So our, our last um, uh, Brain Trust um, uh, friend, member, and speaker, um, I'm going to call on him now. It's Fraser Hughes, who is the CEO of the Global Listed Infrastructure uh, Organization. Uh, over to you, Fraser.
Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Hubert. And just on my side, we're really glad to be involved in this uh, initiative uh, as well. A quick background to my uh, organisation. We were established uh, the same as the GIIA in uh, 2016. We represent uh, about three trillion of pure uh, listed infrastructure uh, companies. So they're listed uh, companies on the uh, on the stock exchange, and they'll cover regulated utilities and renewables, uh, transportation, energy transportation, storage, and communications uh, infrastructure. Our members were sixty five uh, members at the moment, and the membership. Uh, in um, asset value terms cover just over one trillion of uh, asset value. Our mission is really through uh, education and research to promote the benefits of investing in listed infrastructure alongside both direct and uh, unlisted infrastructure uh, investments. So we're not actually saying one is better than the other. We're saying that these uh, types of investment can really work together. One of the other things that we do is on the regulatory side, and we're actually working with uh, Hubert's organization at the moment, promoting the idea of a listed infrastructure uh, investment trust. And um, that recommendation was uh, approved in a recent G20 OECD report. How would we plan to promote the benefits you know, within our uh, membership? I think a key product here is one that we have in the pipeline with GRESP already. So before the end of this year, we plan to launch the GLEO GRESP ESG index. And I think, you know, here really data is key, having the ability to get a benchmark out to the global investment uh, population we can really leverage on. And I do think it goes hand in hand with this SDG uh, uh, framework. So I think there's really something that we can hold on uh, and leverage uh, there. In terms of um, how we get the message out, I mean, you know, firstly, we'll get the message out to our investment managers, the insurance companies, the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, as Duncan uh, pointed out uh, earlier. Um, on the investment management side, I guess most of them are already well aware of, you know, these type of uh, standards. I mean, you only need to look around any presentation they do these days in ESG and SDGs are up the front. But I think where we can really educate uh, our membership is the listed uh, companies themselves. Um, and this has been mentioned, you know, throughout uh, the other comments. I think there's so much in terms of surveys and uh, ESG type of, um, you know, benchmarking that these companies are confused. And I think the fact that we as a group are able to work together and offer them something that is specifically tailored for infrastructure is extremely powerful. So I think um, there's a real opportunity for my organization to promote that amongst, uh, amongst that group. And it is, as I said earlier, a large group in terms of uh, the assets uh, that they own. Uh, finally, the points, how we get this out to a broader kind of network. I and mean, we've got great contacts in the uh, investment press. I mean, we work very closely with a number of the investments uh, or institutional investments uh, press like IPE Real Assets, IREI in the US, etc. They're always looking for material, and I think between us, we can really kind of push that message uh, out there amongst those uh, publications. Also, you've got our newsletter, as Francois uh, pointed out his side. We've got our website uh, as well. And, you know, maybe just to round up my side, again, I think. The fact that we're working hand in hand together, it gives us a superb platform to get the uh, the message of this framework uh, out there. So back over to you, Hubert. Thanks very much, Fraser. You bring a very important and interesting uh, dynamic to this, particularly, uh, you know, as you say, on the, the, the listed constituency side. So we very much uh, look forward to further engagement and further learning, um, you know, as far as, you know, your 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 sort of stakeholders members and uh, eco and ecosystem um are um uh, you know uh, it, working with you in terms of the esg agenda and uh, 
congratulations and, and, and on the uh, ESG index. And I think it's these are the types of products where we take these vertical initiatives and understand that we have to invert it so that we've got a, a horizontal collaborative industry approach where we can all work together and learn from each other. And um, as I bring this, this, this panel and this launch uh, to a close, I think um, in terms of these, you know, couple of uh, closing, uh, closing remarks of mine, I think that is really what we are looking at. And interestingly, as we've um, identified as infrastructure and as uh, institutional infrastructure um, investors and representing that particular community, we are effectively creating a new class of infrastructure, um, which is in the infratech space, where it's, in, it's increasingly recognized uh, the power of data and the data itself is actually infrastructure. So the ability to be able to use this infrastructure being the data and the framework to talk to on almost a, a modular basis uh, and constellate it for different and specific constituencies is a key part of um, at the next phase um, of this particular brain trust activity. Now we have the framework. Um, we will be following up with a number of the um, development finance institutions as well as multilateral um, development banks and international financial institutions to work with them um, and the leaders within their institutions that are responsible for for real assets um, and infrastructure. Um, we, we already have started that conversation and, and had some very positive feedback through Jing Dong Hua, um, who we just heard from, um, and his team. Um, but we'll also be looking to broaden that out on a um, global basis. So we'll be looking to you know, engage colleagues from the Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, from the BRICS uh, Bank, uh, from the European Investment Bank. And I think as we, you know, in this first phase, I have engaged and, and have committed to engage and already engaging our own direct uh, members and, and, and institutional investors and asset owner community, I think there's an important role that we're signaling now and that many of you have encouraged us to do. And we've just, this is just to tell you that we've started that, that process is to really um, map a way forward now about how we as the community can not only share amongst ourselves, but we can also now um, intermediate and, and, and engage and you know, share our knowledge with the um, development finance uh, uh, and development partner uh, community. So we very much look forward to that. Um, this basically forms the, the end of the formal uh, launch of the um, Asset Owners um, SDGs ESG Infrastructure Investment Impact uh, Framework. I uh, thank you all again and thank you all for um, logging in to view this launch and uh, we look forward to working with each of you. Please feel free to, to be in touch um, with us. Thank you very much and goodbye. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.